So yeah, um, so my interests really are a VHF and above my my primary interests, and one of those is uh, sporadic E. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about what what is sporadic E, uh, when it occurs, uh, sporadic E being a, a form of propagation that affects um, the VHF uh, and some oh, the top top mainly the top end HF bands. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, what bands are affected and um, predicting openings using Whisper, which is uh, something that we've done here um, in Australia. So I, I should point out that Tasmania is a, uh, a state of Australia um, that's uh, just south of the Australian mainland. So if you think of uh, Tasmania, the Tasmanian devil, this is the, the home of the Tasmanian devil. So uh, that's where I'm located anyway. So yeah, I'm uh, Hayden VK78JH and as uh, Steve said, I've got a, a Ham Radio DX YouTube channel and uh, also a website there too, which mainly has a lot of my um, video links as well, but uh, there's also some um, other uh, articles that I've uh, written over the years as well. So um, yeah, check that out if you can. So, oh, I'll just minimize my window out of the way. There we go. Um, so uh, what is sporadic E? So sporadic E, uh, as I've written here, is it's probably the most interesting and exciting forms of signal enhancement for the keen VHF operator. So we're talking about anyone who's interested in 28 megahertz, uh, so 10 meters, uh, 50 megahertz, 6 meters, and 144 megahertz, 2 meters amateur bands. So they're the main bands that we see sporadic E propagation on. There are other bands that we do see uh, sporadic E start to take effect on, but they're the main amateur bands. So uh, sporadic E propagation uh, bounces or refracts signals off of what we call smaller clouds of ionized atmospheric gases in the lower E region. So that's approximately 55 to 100 miles above the surface of the earth. And during the right conditions, this allows us to have long distance VHF and UHF communication. So through the wonders of Zoom, I can annotate here, which I didn't plan on doing, but we can see here, so if we've got our, our ground station down here, our signal goes up into the sporadic E layer where this cloud is. Well, my drawing's not too good. And then bounces back down and can also reflect off the earth and then back up and we can cover long, very long distances. So there's more uh, information related to sporadic E uh, on on the web, on Wikipedia and other places, uh, there's a, a, a another Australian amateur, VK3FS, and I use a, a diagram from his website, and he describes sporadic E in, in very great detail as well. So if you want to check out some more information about it, uh, I'll have some links uh, throughout the presentation that uh, you can check those out. So uh, yeah, to, to sum up what sporadic E is, it's, it's a concentration of, of that E layer. Um, it's ionization that's it's really thin, uh, thin but high density, high density ionization, and and this allows radio signals to bounce off of it. So, what causes these clouds or these patches of ionization? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting to note that after almost seventy years of study, the true cause for sporadic E is still unknown. Uh, there's many different theories as to how and why sporadic E clouds form. So, um, and and how they how they form these dense patches of ionization in the E layer. Um, the, they're not uh, related to the sunspot cycle because they come and go uh, every year or every season. The, uh, they are seasonal. So uh, that's, uh, that's it's in no relation to the sunspot cycle, which generally uh, affects the F layer for, for these bands that we're talking about, especially six meters. So some theories that have put uh, have been put forward and the most common theory is uh, high very high altitude wind shear so shearing forces caused by fast moving winds in the upper atmosphere may cause this ionization so what what you get is you get these high altitude winds which are traveling in opposite directions at different altitudes uh, and hitting each other causing this wind shear and it's believed that um, that these wind shears in the presence of the earth's geomagnetic field this causes ions to be collected and they get compressed into these thin iron rich layers that sit in our upper atmosphere. And they can be approximately one and a uh, one half to one mile in thickness um, generally. So um, they're not particularly that, that thick. 
Uh, and the areas of these patches, so if, if we if you think about clouds, when you look up in the sky and you see physical clouds, you know that clouds can be quite patchy. Uh, it's the same in the upper atm atmosphere. Of course, you can't see sporadic key particles that are all uh, um, forming, but they can be dotted all around the place and they can vary from a few square miles to hundreds or even thousands of square miles. Uh, the next theory uh, that sporadic E can also be caused by uh, electrical storms. So um, electrical storms may extend high in altitude and the various um, thunderstorm activity may correlate to the formation of sporadic E. So um, ionization uh, in this particular uh, or, or as a result of a particular storm. Um, the correlating this between thunderstorm activity so for instance if you have a thunderstorm in your local area um, it's not necessarily going to mean that you're going to receive sporadic e it's just uh, sorry it's not necessarily going to contribute towards the uh, development of a sporadic e cloud but uh, there is some evidence to suggest that it helps in some situations so um yeah, a lot of this is theory based. It's very difficult to to prove these things, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, another form is um, is electrical is electrical storms. And there is a talk by a meteorologist from the RSG at an RSGB convention, and he talks about this more in, in detail. And it's quite interesting. Um, you can look that up on YouTube. I think if you just search for sporadic E RSGB, it's a, a talk that was done last year. And, uh, and he goes into uh, great detail about that. Uh, the other um, theory as well is meteors. Of course, um, we know that meteors travel into the Earth's atmosphere all the time and burn up, uh, causing ionization trails behind them. Um, and anyone who's familiar with VHF will probably know about meteor scatter, where you can bounce uh, signals off that meteor trail. Um, but there are some theories that say that... Uh, Meteors entering the atmosphere can burn up in the in the E layer region, causing some uh, some uh, E layer activity, causing these these clouds to form uh, through the through this meteor debris that's been left. Um, again, the, there does seem to be a strong correlation between meteor shower activity and the number and intensity of sporadic E clouds. So, uh, again, a, another theory which which uh, uh, contributes towards this phenomenon. But uh, I think the main point of this is that nobody has presented a definitive explanation for how and why sporadic E clouds form. We, we just don't know why. Um, and sometimes with radio and the, the magics of, of DX, it's, sometimes it's great that way because it just uh, catches us by surprise. Uh, so as I mentioned about the, the clouds, so the clouds, they vary greatly in size and also in their intensity. Um, some can be a few meters across, some several hundred uh, kilometers so uh, i should have written that in miles um <laughs> i think that's a couple of a couple of hundred miles um and yeah you sorry they're usually only very thin i think in a previous slide i i made a mistake and i said that they could be um uh, uh, up to a mile thick i think they're i meant to say they're only a tenth of a mile thick so uh they're they're very 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 thin uh so they form at random uh, but they uh, they do move, so uh, they they will move uh, due to them being very high in the upper atmosphere. They can move at very very fast speeds, so that can be up to four hundred uh, kilometers per hour, and this can result in your if you're listening to a, a signal on a sporadic E signal, the signal can disappear and reappear quite rapidly. So you could have um, a station that you're listening to; they could be five nine plus. 20 and all of a sudden they'll go to they'll just disappear and then they could come back up again so um, the uh, depending on where the the source of the signal is coming from and what uh, cloud you're hearing that off so what sort of skip distances and bands are we talking about so as i mentioned before we're talking about the 10 meter band so 28 megahertz the 6 meter band which is uh, 50 megahertz the FM broadcast band, which is also a very interesting one, uh, allows us to receive signals uh, from 88 to 108 megahertz. And usually we can use that to find out when we can use two meters or above. Now, uh, I'll get into uh, it in a, a further slide, but 
Uh, one thing that I did mention about the that I should have mentioned about the clouds is that there is a maximum usable frequency of each uh, sporadic E cloud. So, and that's dependent on uh, on the thickness of the cloud, uh, how much ionization is in the cloud, and uh, this can affect what frequency uh, gets refracted off of it. So. Generally, what we start to see is as the lower bands, the, the skip distances start to shorten, that's when we can say that the higher frequencies are a chance of working uh, at longer distances. So, for instance, if we get a, uh, a, a six-meter signal that's sort of uh, four to 500 miles, we can expect that two meters may potentially open up. It's not always a guarantee, but it is a good sign. And there is also evidence to say that sporadic E does affect the, uh, for, for the United States, uh, 220 megahertz. I think you're the only country that's got access to the 1.25 meter band. So uh, we don't have that here in Australia, but there has been cases of, of signals uh, up uh, that high. Uh, that band in Australia is a digital television band. So um, it would be interesting if someone took the time to see if they could receive digital television that high uh, when it opens up. Uh, they'd have to be very, very patient um, because uh, as we'll, we'll see, um, it doesn't happen all that often. So the maximum distances which we can uh, hear or work, I suppose, is around 1,430 miles. So 2,300 uh, kilometers for those uh, in metric and that is a single hop. Now, double hops are common and even multi-hops have allowed contacts up to 10,000 kilometers on uh, 10 meters and six meters and 3,000 kilometers on, on two meters. I apologize again for the interchangeable kilometers and miles. <laughs> Might have to do some conversion on the fly, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, so we can potentially see uh, a uh, very long distances. When the sunspot cycle is high and the F layer is also uh, active, uh, this can also uh, the E layer can also enhance signals over very great distances. So we can uh, have a sporadic E um, signal, maybe at one end, then it goes into the F layer and goes a few more thousand kilometers, and then comes out on another E layer, and all sorts of possibilities are are uh, uh, can happen. And it's greatly illustrated here. The, uh, the first illustration shows uh, three sporadic E clouds. Uh, cloud number one is uh, more intensely ionized and thus it's capable of refracting signals at a sharper angle and it produces a shorter skip distance for a given frequency. So you can see that yellow line um, with the, uh, with the uh, short distance uh, that's coming out of the transmitter on the left-hand side. Signals that might hit, say, cloud number two produce longer skip distances. So cloud two and three, um, you can see there cloud number three's sort of got a, a double hop. So you can see the blue line goes up to cloud number two down into what we call the skip zone. So that's the, the longest distance possible, bouncing back up and maybe even going on even further and further. So uh, the the max as I said the maximum distance for a single hop is is around about uh, 2300 to 2500 kilometers or so so if if though if we have sufficiently ionized patches along the particular signal path it's possible for the signal as I said to keep reflecting off of the earth and maybe hit a second sporadic E cloud or maybe uh, if it's as I said the the Sunspot cycle is high. It may even um, uh, reflect or refract, sorry, off of the F layer and keep on going and, and extend our signals way out to, you know, um, distances that we certainly wouldn't expect on VHF. So uh, this the second photo also shows to uh, the sorry the second diagram on the right hand side shows that we can also have uh, sporadic. E paths cloud to cloud. So rather than it reflecting off of the earth, it can also just simply reflect straight off of uh, from one cloud to another. So there's all sorts of ways that the signal can get from A to B. So when does it open? So this is uh, probably the most important part of the entire uh, presentation is when can we hear these signals? They don't happen all year, uh, every day. Uh, they they when they do happen they're very random so sporadic e happens at 
mid latitudes, so around 15 to 45 degrees. Uh, they may happen at any time. Um, however, there's a distinct peak in the months leading up to and including summer and a smaller peak in winter as well. So we've just passed our sporadicy uh, season here. It started in mid-November and extended all the way to around about late January. So we got about uh, two and a half, almost three months of sporadic activity here in uh, in Australia. <clears throat> in the normal in the northern hemisphere, this generally correlates to about May till July. Um, so yeah, your uh, your late spring to um, mid to late summer months. Um, they're the main peaks. However, it is good to note that sporadic can occur at any time, um, but they're, they're the main peaks that you'll, you'll find. Uh, sporadic is generally likely to occur between 9 a.m. and noon local time. And again, there's uh, another um, peak time of about 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, Again, this is a, a, a likely thing that can happen. This is based on uh, statistics that, it, that people have, have taken noted down times. And of course, it varies on location as well. Uh, but between nine and noon uh, is, is generally a good time to be listening around on the bands to see uh, if you can hear anything. And these, these openings, they can arrange, arrange from a few seconds to many hours and even all day. I, I do remember uh, this last season, we did have a particular day where it lasted uh, from, I think it was about 7 a.m. in the morning and lasted till uh, the early hours of the next morning of the next day. So uh, you can have uh, very long extended openings. So how often does it open? So during these peak times, 10 meters almost every day. Uh, you can work someone on 10 meters uh, as long as there's someone at the other end calling CQ, of course, um, have a listen around on beacons uh, and also uh, check out um, FT8 or whisper or other modes as well uh, on 10 meters. I'm pretty sure that you'll be able to see uh, someone uh, operating uh, there almost every, every day. Six meters is about as uh, half as many days as, uh, as 10 meters. So uh, six meters it, it also does depend on the level of activity. So here in, in VK land, we've got quite a lot of activity on six meters. So generally, uh, almost every day of the sporadic key season just gone, we had, I, I, in my own personal station, saw um, at least one DX station that was in another state. So uh, it, it, uh, it, it is dependent, yeah, on, on activity. Uh, two meters though is only about one tenth as many days as six meters and as well as being one tenth as many days it's probably the the duration of time that it opens up is also probably only about one tenth as well so uh, two meters becomes a bit of a a rarity that only happens every so often but when it does happen it can it can explode and you can work a lot of stations so i suppose you just got to be there at the right time uh, and just to throw in uh, 1.25 meters uh, 222 megahertz it's about one one hundredth as many days as two meters so uh, to put that in some sort of perspective i think i read some stats once on 1.25 meters and i think that uh, if if two meters was to open uh, I think one day every year, I think 1.25 meters was something like one day every 10 years or something to that effect. So it, <laughs> I think that was the math was correct there, but uh, it is very, very rare. Um, so that, yeah, as I said, these are averages. Uh, some sporadic key seasons are better than others. The one that's just gone here in Australia was probably one of the best sporadic key seasons I can, I can think of in the last five years at least. Um, and uh, the more days that are open, generally the shorter duration uh, of openings. So um, some days you can go for, say, a week and you don't have any openings at all, uh, but uh, then you'll have a day just pop out out of nowhere and the duration will be very long. So I hope that makes sense. But uh, this uh, season that's just gone, we definitely had uh, yeah, a very, very good season. And actually, I've got a slide which, which demonstrates that. Uh, so I talked about the MUF. So uh, MUF, um, 
meaning maximum usable frequency in the cloud. So the amount by which the path of a radio signal is refracted by sporadic heat clouds depends on the intensity of ionization and the frequency of the signal. So for a given level of ionization, the signal refraction angle will decrease as the frequency is increased. So above a certain frequency, uh, uh, sorry, above a certain critical frequency, refraction of the signal will be insufficient to return it to the surface of the earth. So uh, if you're above the maximum usable frequency, the signal will just pass straight through the cloud. It won't return back to the earth. So this is known as the MUF. As the MUF gets higher, uh, that means that the ability for the frequency to be refracted back towards Earth uh, is, is greatly increased. So it's been observed over the years that the signal uh, strength of received sporadic E signals will be greatest just below the maximum usable frequency. Um, so, um, for instance, if, if we know that the, if the MUF, say, reaches 30 megahertz, then it's probably a good indication that 10 meters is going to work. If it's say 60, 70 megahertz, we know that six meters should work and so on and so forth. Uh, since the bending angle or the angle of refraction decreases as the signal, incre uh, signal frequency increases uh, for a given ionization level, we can surmise that the most distant receptions will occur as we approach the MUF. So in other words, if a sporadic heat cloud will support longer paths at 100 megahertz, then it will be shorter at 50 megahertz. So um, I hope that uh, that all makes sense. Um, so the uh, MUF, uh, the, the maximum usable frequency is an important thing uh, when it comes to sporadic E. Um, so yeah, as a, as to, so just sort of to summarize, so um, as lower frequency skip distances get shorter, then the chances of a higher frequency being ref uh, reflected are higher. So uh, one, 144 megahertz divided by 50 is about one third. So when the skip distance on six meters shortens to around uh, 435 miles, so if you're working a station 435 miles away and you know that it's sporadic E and, and you're confident about that, uh, then um, it may potentially get up to two meters then. So you can, uh, you can uh, then start to look for two meter stations. So here's an example. Um, and this is out of the ARRL handbook. So uh, in this uh, particular example, there's a 50 megahertz sporadic E contacts that are happening over that 435 mile range. Um, or shorter. So they've got between, I think it's Peora and Little Rock. Sorry, my geography is terrible. So um, you would no doubt know what states these are in. Um, but uh, we can see there that there is a midpoint of the path. So that's where the cloud is located that both stations are pointing towards or beaming towards or their signals being reflected off. So the solid line there, that's the 50 megahertz path. That's also indicating that there may be a two meter path uh, by the dotted line, which, uh, which is sort of off to a, um, a, an angle there between uh, Pieri and Talassi. Sorry if I mispronounce that, <laughs> but uh, um, contact should be possible uh, across that sort of path. So I'm hoping that all this makes sense. It all sounds a bit theoretical, but in practice, it's actually a lot, lot easier. And we'll go into some um, uh, antennas and what you need to be able to take advantage of this when it comes along. So what antenna and polarization do you need? Well, for sporadic E, the good news is that an omnidirectional antenna will work fine. You don't need, you don't necessarily need a directional antenna. A Yagi will work better if you're pointing in the direction of the cloud. However, I demonstrated this year that you do not necessarily need a directional antenna. You can get great results on an omnidirectional um, antenna. Uh, polarization shifting can occur, but it's generally um, it's generally not really a, an issue. You can run horizontal or vertical. Uh, mainly, the, the the good rule of thumb is is that on two meters, if you're working um, FM contacts, you generally run vertical. If you're 
trying for sideband contacts, you run horizontal. Um, and due to other factors such as tropospheric ducting, uh, which does does depend on polarization, um, generally it's best to just use what you got, I suppose. Um, but yeah, good results can be had on a vertical antenna, especially on t uh, 10 meters and six meters. Um, and I had some outstanding results this, uh, this last uh, sporadic east season on six meters using nothing but a diamond V2000 vertical. So uh, that worked really well. Um, so that's all well and good, but how do we know when it opens? How do we know when the band's going to be supporting sporadic key contacts? How do we take advantage of this? Well, the short answer is we can't. We don't know. It's sporadic. That's, that's the whole reason why it's called that. We don't know when it's going to happen. But as I said, we do have a general rule of thumb. We know the peak seasons. We know the general times. Um, and we can take advantage of things such as beacons. Um, we can call CQ. Uh, we can tune around the band. I know that here in Australia, I'm not sure what the call frequency over is over there, but we generally hang around 50 decimal 110 on six meters. Um, and on 10 meters and two meters, we also have call frequencies, which we, we listen on as well. <clears throat> and it's generally a good idea to, to call CQ when you start to hear some signals appearing uh, also as i said the fm broadcast band so many uh, dx's here in australia will use the fm signals to determine where where they're hearing distances from and then they'll point their yagis in that direction and, and call cq so uh, the fm broadcast band is a very uh, good uh, indicator of uh, conditions <clears throat> The other way is with digital modes, we can predict and we can even plot where an opening is occurring, um, even when it's weak. So uh, dig with digital modes working way below the noise, um, sometimes it gives us a bit of an advantage because we can tell if an opening uh, is potentially coming before it even reaches the, the levels required for voice or CW communication. So one of the things that we've been doing here is using Whisper. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Whisper, it's a beacon mode, uh, which is packaged in the WSJTX uh, program, so the same program that runs FT8. Uh, Whisper implements a protocol which is designed for probing potential propagation paths with low power transmissions over a two-minute cycle. So what Whisper does is it transmits a two-minute beacon and stations can receive that, that, uh, that beacon signal and they can decode a call sign uh, a grid square and a power output level. And then all of that gets sent to the internet and we can plot it on a map and see who's hearing what. Uh, the program works with signal to noise ratios as low as minus 31 dB. I actually think that it's even lower now because they've released a new version of WSJTX, which I think it might even go minus 33 or even lower. Um, and as I said, yes, yeah, so those that have, uh, that have internet access upload it to a central database called WhisperNet. And as a bit of an example, here is a map which shows the continent or country of Australia and all of the stations uh, that were on at this particular time. So uh, all those lines are signals that are being heard between each uh, station. And if you go to the WhisperNet website you can click on a particular station and you can see and hear uh, uh, see and view all of the stations that uh, each one is hearing or has been heard by so this uh, this diagram was uh, was a six meter uh, map and in the little box there there is quite a lot of short stations um, if I can just annotate again I'll just change my color to red that might be a bit easier to see uh, or maybe not uh, let me go green. Oh, that's not good either. I'll just uh, draw a big, big circle. So in here, there's a high concentration of stations which are relatively close together. They're not. Uh, they're spaced out uh, enough from these stations up here that they can't be heard directly through um, ground wave propagation. Uh, and they were hearing very, very strong signals between each other on six meters. And uh, the distance between these two stations is about roughly, uh, I think about three to, yeah, three to 400 miles. 
So what that meant was that I'm located down here in the south, uh, the very southern state of Australia. And it meant that I could, uh, if you can see that, I could work stations up here to Brisbane in Queensland on two metres. So while stations were working six metres across this path, I was working two metres up into Queensland, Australia, which was about 1,800 to 2,000 kilometres away. Uh, it also extends over to here in New Zealand as well. Um, unfortunately, it's not as easy to work New Zealand on Sporadic E because there are no stations in the middle. This is all sea, so we can't take advantage of that. But, uh, but it does happen. And on the next slide here, uh, these are some of the two meter signals that were received. So <clears throat> as I said, I'm located down there in Tasmania. You can see those lines that are, are drawn up to uh, the uh, Brisbane stations and also a couple there in uh, New South Wales, sorry, Queensland stations, I should say. And uh, there's some signals uh, and they're uh, and the signal to noise ratios and the frequency and all this sort of stuff you can pull out of WhisperNet. So there was quite some strong signals. There was one there, uh, plus 20 dB above the noise. So that would have easily have supported a voice contact. Um, unfortunately, I think I was at work at the time, so I couldn't take advantage of that. Uh, there's another one here that was plus seven. And, uh, and there was even here one between uh, New Zealand, the top end of New Zealand and South Australia in uh, VK5 and that is a that's over 3000 kilometers away so uh, quite a long distance um, and and again these are all uh, sporadic e contacts now uh, that was the 2019 2020 uh, season the 20 tw uh, the 2020 2021 season I, I haven't updated these slides for that yet but I did update this next slide which would be of uh, interest uh, to you. This is actually a screenshot of uh, some six meter paths between Australia and the United States. Uh, this happened over the course of several days and this was taken from PSK Reporter. And there were several stations who were working FT8 from Australia through to New Zealand. And I think you actually uh, jogged my memory at the start of the uh, presentation Steve when you said about Tucson Arizona because my uh, vertical antenna that I had been running here is not very in an it's not in an optimum position it's just out the on my back porch and I decided that over these uh, these days where we were hearing signals from the United States I thought I would see if I could at least hear something in the hope that I would hear uh, a station from uh, the US and sure enough I did and I believe that there were several stations from Tucson and Arizona that I heard uh, on uh, on six meters uh, just using a vertical antenna on FT8. Um, I probably wouldn't have had much uh, chance of working them back. Uh, they would have been doing all the heavy lifting with no doubt large antennas and lots of power but uh, it, it is indeed possible. Um, unfortunately, here in Australia, we're not as keen in winter <laughs> for your summer. We really should, uh, but there is a chance that you may also work um, work uh, uh, VK um, in uh, the next coming months. So one of the other things that we do here as well is uh, there's a program which has been written by VK4 ADC, and there's a link there, but if you just Google uh, VK4 ADC, you'll find his website and it's called Whisper View. And what this does is it pulls all the data out of Whisper uh, View, uh, sorry, Whisper Net. And it basically tables all of the information that is in uh, Whisper Net to a bit of a more user-friendly type um, interface, which allows us to see the short distance signals on six meters. So this is all six meter uh, data. And then we can, go through and look at in real time almost what signals are potentially uh, high maximum usable frequency e-layer signals that may support two meters or, or, or even FM broadcast band or, two, or you know the higher bands up to two meters. So there's a couple of examples there. There's uh, one that's uh, the top one there's uh, 570 uh, kilometers. So that's sort of a, um, a high 
a high signal to noise ratio and short distance for six meters. A bit further down, there's another one which is plus seven, which is 670, uh, 667 kilometers. So again, we're looking for strong signals that are over very short distances. And these should correlate to uh, the potential for the MUF to rise to 144 megahertz so that we can work those stations on two meters. Because as I said, it's, it's much more rare that it happens on two meters. But if we can use the information and the data that we've got uh, in front of us at that particular time, then it's a lot easier for us to work out when it actually happens. And it is a bit of a thrill to, you know, work a station on, on two meters, which is generally classed as a line of sight type band uh, over several thousands of kilometers or miles. Um, it's, it's quite exciting. So, uh, so some of the results. So what we can do with this, we can plot where the current openings are occurring. Uh, once signals are generally above uh, 5 dB on whisper, uh, reporting that, then that's where SSB voice might be possible. Uh, minus 10 or higher, generally CW. So if you've got a good ear, you could probably hear down to minus 15. But uh, yeah, CW generally is about minus 10. Uh, when signals become very strong over that short path, we can possibly predict that uh, two meters is going to open. And I've personally used this method to detect openings and report them on spotters, loggers, and via social media to let others know openings are happening, but you need to be quick. So the whole idea is once you hear a station like that, spot it, tell as many people as you can, and hopefully that will lead to lots of people getting on the air so uh, as an example um, a few years back i set up uh, uh, using that whisper view uh, program that i just showed a few slides back that does email you uh, any alerts or any spots and i received a spot that i was being heard over a very short distance to um, uh, canberra which is the capital of australia uh, which is a short, a very short distance on six meters. So I jumped on two meters. I called CQ, and uh, surprisingly, I had several stations come back to me. So without having that email, um, I think I was, I think I was vacuuming actually in my living room at the time. So without knowing about that and receiving that spot, I would never have been able to work on two meters. And I think the opening on two meters lasted about a good ten or fifteen minutes. And there is a video on my YouTube channel of that. So. Uh, that was uh, that was quite good. Otherwise, I would have just kept on vacuuming and not ever known about it. Um, so there are some further resources here. Uh, there's on Facebook. We've got some groups. We've got a VHF Whisper group, uh, which is uh, two meters and above. Uh, we've also got a six meter one and a ten meter one. So uh, these are, whilst these are Whisper groups, they do generally. Um, concentrate around sporadic E and also uh, tropospheric ducting as well, uh, especially on two meters. Um, so if you're interested in in that sort of VHF propagation, uh, you can uh, you can find some information on Facebook. Uh, VK3FS, um, if you uh, do a search for his call sign, VK3FS uh, uh, sporadic E, he's got an excellent um, sort of summary. Um, article on his website which details uh, a little bit more theory about sporadic key so um, yeah shout out to andrew's uh, website there and also on my website too as i said i've got some articles which i've written over the years and uh, some other um, interesting observations that i've had uh, with sporadic key as well so that's just uh, hamradiodx.net and uh, there's a little um, sidebar where you can click on uh, on the sporadic key category uh, and as I said, there's also some videos. So anyone who's familiar with my channel, there's uh, quite a few. Uh, the Sporadic E on 50 and 144 megahertz video is uh, an interesting one. I was uh, filming a video at the time of a six meter opening and then all of a sudden uh, two meters opened up and I managed to, to capture some two meter contacts, which is good uh, using my remote station. Uh, uh, there's the, the other one where I was vacuuming, as I said, uh, that's the, the one with the FT857 down in the bottom right hand corner. And, uh, just this year, I just added this slide in about half an hour ago, um, at the top right hand corner is, uh, just a summary 
of the stations that I heard on six meters using just that vertical antenna. And I believe that the call signs of those stations in, in Arizona, and I think I, I think it was Texas as well, um, are, are listed in that video. So um, off the top of my head, I can't remember them, but, uh, but they are listed there. So yeah, almost uh, 9,000 miles on, on six meters is quite impressive with the vertical antenna. So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much the end of the, um, the slides that I've got, but, uh, I hope that that all, uh, that all made sense. It, it is a bit of a, an interesting, uh, topic. Um, and, uh, and I hope that, uh, um, it's not, a, it's not a well understood topic. Um, but, uh, but hopefully, uh, you can uh, have a bit of a go and work some uh, stations and with, uh, with, uh, common radios like the FT, uh, 7300 they've all got hf in them but uh, most of these hf radios have uh, six meters in them as well and it's quite easy to build a six meter antenna and uh, and give it a go